Number 1. On March 3, 1993, Gillian Fuller spent the late hours of the evening reading at the pub upstairs at the Fraser Arms Hotel, located at 1450 SW Marine Drive in Vancouver, British Columbia. A few hours later, at around 1.30 a.m. on March 4, Gillian headed to the pub downstairs called the Rock Cellar Pub. She hung out there for about 10 minutes before stepping out into the cool spring air to begin her short walk home. A newspaper delivery person called 911 to report a fire at an apartment building located at 8770 Granville Street at approximately 4 a.m. The Vancouver Fire Department responded and found Jillian's apartment on fire and the young woman dead on her bed. An autopsy later determined that Jillian had been assaulted, it is not specified if this assault was sexual in nature and was dead before the fire, leading the authorities to believe that the fire had been set specifically to conceal the crime. Despite an investigation that has spanned decades and has included numerous tips and interviews, Jillian's case remains unsolved. According to the police, there is only one real possible theory, Jillian was murdered by someone she knew. There was no sign of forced entry at her apartment, which indicated to the police that Jillian willingly opened the door for her killer. The top mortise and strike plate in the photo below were in use at the time, not the lower set that appears somewhat damaged. I am left wondering, though, how well the person who killed Jillian knew her. Could her murderer have been someone from her inner circle, such as a friend or an ex? Or perhaps a person she had just met? Who would Jillian have opened the door for in the wee hours of the morning? There are mixed messages about Jillian and the kind of life that she led, which is pretty uncommon in murder cases. More often than not, victims are portrayed through an angelic lens, even though we all know the majority of people are far from perfect. On the one hand, Jillian is described as athletic, intelligent, and outgoing. At one time she was ranked as a top Canadian outdoor speed skater and was a competitive runner. She was also considered an expert pianist and extremely proficient in French. Gillian was said to enjoy time with her family and friends. On the other hand, it has been reported that Gillian was a loner who lived on government assistance, had previously been in treatment for alcoholism, and often spent time with questionable characters at the Fraser Arms Hotel. No doubt the truth about Jillian is complex, as it is for most of us, and falls somewhere in between. However, her own father, George Fuller, told the media that she had been assaulted twice in recent months by drinking companions and had been engaged to a man with a lengthy criminal record. Could Jillian have been murdered by her ex-fiancé? Or even by one of the questionable friends she had been drinking within the months leading up to her death? If we believe that Jillian would only have opened the door in the middle of the night for someone she knew, then either one of these scenarios are possible. The police undoubtedly questioned her ex-finance and friends, but must never have turned up anything that could inextricably link them to Jillian's death. On the night of Jillian's murder, during the ten minutes or so she spent at the Rock Cellar pub in the basement of the Fraser Arms Hotel, she was seen chatting with an unidentified man. Some accounts say Jillian was seen leaving the pub with this man, whereas others indicate that they left separately but made plans to meet later. In either case, the police are still anxious to talk to this person of interest, hoping that he can provide insight into what happened to Jillian. This unidentified person of interest is described as a dark-skinned white male, 28 to 29 years old, of average height, with thick eyebrows. A bizarre twist in the case occurred in November 1993. The Vancouver Police Department received an anonymous letter sent from Washington, D.C. Although the police have kept confidential much of the information in the letter for investigative reasons, a friend of Jillian's family informed me that the letter included information about a possible suspect. The name of this potential suspect has never been released, and the sender of the letter remains unknown. Considering the numerous cold cases that have recently been solved using DNA evidence, I cannot help but hope that the police have forensic evidence in this case that they have not disclosed. The letter and its envelope could have resulted in the tipster's DNA if the stamp and letter flap were tested and the DNA matched someone already in the system. If this tipster is legitimate, determining who they are could bring the authorities one step closer to identifying Jillian's killer. Also, although the police will only go as far as to say that Jillian was assaulted, I think it is probable she was sexually assaulted. 
The neighbors said there was blood in the apartment and that Jillian was naked on her bed when she was found. If she was sexually assaulted, the killer could have left behind semen that could be tested for DNA. Keep in mind, though, this requires that the evidence was collected and stored properly and that the fire did not damage the evidence. Additionally, if a viable DNA sample was collected, it still would have to match someone already in the DNA databanks. Given all of the ifs necessary for forensics to close this case, I believe that it is crucial for members of the public with any information about Jillian's murder to come forward. Shortly after the 20th anniversary of Jillian's murder, Jillian's sister Jane released a statement on behalf of the Fuller family. The toll that my sister's death has caused my family over the last 20 years is truly immeasurable. It cast a dark cloud on our family that has never been lifted. Her loss has left a deep wound in all our lives, and the fact that her killer was never found means that wound will always be unhealed. Both of Jillian's parents have died without knowing who was responsible for the death of their daughter. Her remaining loved ones deserve answers and at least some measure of justice. The Vancouver Police Department has made numerous appeals for information that could assist with closing Jillian's case. Police Constable Brian Montague explained, It's pretty rare that someone commits an offense like this and keeps it to themselves. They usually tell somebody or they usually make some sort of a mistake and leave some information behind or leave some sort of trace and there's a witness out there that has that piece of the puzzle that will allow us to solve it. Somebody out there has information that will be helpful to the investigation. If you have any information about Jillian's murder, contact the Vancouver Police Department Homicide Unit at 604-717-2500 or Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. Number 2. In 2002, nine-year-old Tiana Martin was living with her aunt, Tamara Lynette Robinson, with her cousin and her 11-year-old and 13-year-old sisters. The five of them were living in an apartment complex in the 4400 block of West Avalon Avenue in Fresno, California. Their mother couldn't afford to take of them as she had lost her job. On September 8, 2003, Tamara asked her sister-in-law to babysit the girls while she ran errands. All but Tiana arrived at the home and when asked the response was that she was out of town. Tamara then came home and acted upset asking where Tiana was. They then searched for THE 10-year-old and called the police and reported missing at 1.30 a.m. on September 9. Tamara claimed that she last saw her at 7.30 a.m. the day before. Hours later Tamara was arrested and charged with two counts of felony corporal injury to a child and child endangerment. In documents, her sisters indicated that they were both abused. One of them had also told the school vice principal that Tamara killed Tiana. Tiana had in fact been missing since either July or August. It was found that Tamara told people that Tiana was gone for the summer or back with her mother. She missed a July 7 appointment. Her sister went to a birthday party around the same time and friends thought it was strange Tiana wasn't there. When the girls started school in late August, Tiana wasn't listed on her siblings' emergency contact forms as a sister and didn't fill out Tiana's card. She had also filled out forms for welfare and named her daughter and Tiana's sisters, but not her as dependents. She wrote down that Tiana went to live with her mother. This was not true, though. Relatives of the girls began to question about Tiana, and this was when Tamara decided to report her missing. Sources said that Tamara beat Tiana to death. She claimed the girl was likely last seen in July 11th. She described the girl as a problem child and her sisters as liars. She said that one of the girls had actually hurt or killed Tiana after a fight about physical exercises. Police believe Tamara had beaten Tiana to death. Her sisters were forced to help dispose of Tiana's body. Tiana was likely disposed of in a trash bin a week after her death and she had been her body would be at American Avenue Landfill in Fresno on American Avenue. Two weeks were spent searching for her remains at the landfill, but they weren't recovered. Over a year later Tamara was charged with murder. At her trial, both of Tiana's sisters testified against her. They stated at the trial that they watched their aunt strip Tiana down to her underwear. She then locked her in the hot garage without water for around 30 minutes. 
She then proceeded to hit the girl's head against the wall and severely beat her with items such as a baseball bat, a meat tenderizer, a curtain rod, and a vacuum cleaner hose. She did this till Tiana was dead. She then tried to revive the girl by doing CPR, but it was useless. She then realized she killed the girl had her sisters redress her and kept the body in the apartment for a week. She then had the girls help her with wrapping the body in plastic bags and put her in the apartment complex dumpster. She then poured bleach over the body to disguise the smell. Tamara denied this, but in 2006, she was convicted of second-degree murder and felony child abuse. She was acquitted of child endangerment. She was sentenced 15 years to life in prison and was given three years of credit due to staying in jail during her trial. Tiana was 10 years old at the time and is African-American. She was 5'5 five five and 80 pounds at the time. She had Graves' disease which is a rare autoimmune hyperthyroid disorder. Her condition did require close medical supervision and makes her physically weak. It's fatal without treatment. Number 3. Patricia Bovin was murdered when she was only 22 years old. She lived at 790 King Street in London, Ontario with her two children. A friend called Patricia on Thursday, April 24, 1969. When she didn't answer, the friend went by the apartment at 4 p.m. that afternoon and found Patricia's body. It was a nightmare scene. Patricia's two young boys, aged one and three, were by their mother's body. It was as if they were waiting for her to wake up. They were sobbing, dirty, and hungry. The front door that accessed the staircase was unlocked, and a neighbor found a pillowcase covered in blood by the front of the building. Therefore, the front door was the probable entry point. There were no obvious signs of forced entry. The apartment was in disarray. Chairs and other items were scattered around. Not by the murderer, though. The children had moved the items in an attempt to reach food. Nothing was stolen from the apartment. Patricia was stabbed over a dozen times in the torso while asleep on the couch. She had no defensive wounds and wasn't sexually assaulted. Patricia's murder remains unsolved. Was Patricia murdered by her ex-boyfriend? Patricia's ex killed himself within hours of finding out about her murder. Was he overcome with grief? Or did he kill himself to avoid punishment? It's impossible to know for sure. But the neighbors didn't hear any arguing. And Patricia had no defensive wounds. This suggests that Patricia wasn't killed during a fight with her ex. In Murder City, Michael Arnfield connects Patricia's murder with the murder of Victoria Mayo. Victoria was a recently divorced 32-year-old mother. Her murder occurred on the morning of August 6, 1964. Victoria lived in London, Ontario at 194 Sydenham Street. Her child found Victoria dead in bed. She'd been stabbed over a dozen times in the torso while asleep. Neighbors heard Victoria's son's cries and called the police. The police were let in by the building superintendent. The door was locked and the child was too young to reach the lock. The police didn't find any useful fingerprints or footprints. This is odd because the perpetrator needed to scale a wall and climb through the window to enter the apartment. The police did, however, identify the killer's blood type. He cut himself during the attack. Thirty more years would pass, though, before DNA testing was possible. The similarities to Patricia's case are startling. Home invasion style entry. No witnesses. Killed while asleep. Nothing stolen. No defensive wounds. No sexual assault. Stabbed multiple times in the torso. Children unharmed. And the women's homes were only 3.7 kilometers, 2.30 mi, apart. In October of 1967, Sander Fulop confessed to Victoria's murder. He was an unemployed Hungarian transient worker. Sander, though, wasn't held accountable for his crime. First he was deemed mentally unfit. And then authorities said there was a lack of evidence to support his confession. Shortly afterwards, he was cured and released. In February 2000, London Police Service announced that Project Angel had solved Victoria's murder. The unit exhumed Sander's body, conducted DNA testing, and determined Sander was indeed Victoria's killer. Patricia's and Victoria's murders are so similar. 
I think it's possible that Sander also murdered Patricia, and perhaps many more women. Patricia and her loved ones deserve justice. If you have any information about this murder, please contact London Police Service at 519-661-5670. Number 4. Quebec Provincial Police have reopened the unsolved homicide of Sylvie Lavardier, 24, whose mutilated body was found in her apartment in Sweet Therese in April, 1989. Police set up a command post in the town, north of Laval, hoping that someone will come forward with new information. Investigators say they are looking to speak to anyone who lived in the same neighborhood as Lavardier in 1989, anyone who knew Lavardier, and anyone who might have noticed something out of the ordinary around the time the woman was killed. Suri du Quebec Sergeant Benoit Richard said many people were questioned at the time of Lavardier's death, but no one was arrested. Some items that didn't belong to the woman were found in her apartment. We have some new ways to look at those things that were seized, said Richard. We're trying to get people to come and talk to us, to see if we can link those things with somebody. For Lavertier's mother, seeing her daughter's case reopened is painful, but it brings new hope as well. When you have kids, and you're close, and you speak to them every day, then suddenly there are no more phone calls, and you wait, but no there will never be any calls again it's not easy, Janine Couturier said. I'm asking people, no matter how small the information may be that you have, please, as Sylvie's mother, I would like you to call. Lavertier's disappearance was noted after she failed to show up at a Rosemere gym where she worked as a manager. Her body was found in her basement apartment on April 18, 1989. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Her purse was found 2.5 kilometers from her apartment on Sweet Therese Road near Highway 640. Anyone with information about Lavertier's murder is asked to call police at 1-800-659-4264. Number 5. Five years after her murder, the family of murdered teen Jada Rankin is looking for closure, my heart is so heavy and so broken, said Tawana Rankin, her mother. Today marks three years with no justice. Jada Rankin was 15 years old at the time of the shooting that took place on October 16, 2016 on Armour Street in Detroit. On Wednesday the family spoke at a Detroit playground now named after Jada, recalling that horrific day. I pray every day and every night that my daughter's murder does not go in vain, Tawana said. The Sterling Heights teen was celebrating her brother's 23rd birthday at her grandmother's home on Detroit's west side. Jada left the party with family when her brother noticed a car speeding down the street. Her brother yelled for the driver to slow down. The driver then stopped, opened his car door, and shot into the crowd striking Jada. The bullet pierced her abdomen. She was rushed to the hospital, but it was too late. She was murdered for no reason at all, Tawana said. The shooter drove off and one of Jada's family members tried to go after him, but hit a pole instead. Since then, the case grew cold. But Detroit police released a sketch earlier this year of Jada's possible killer. He is described as about 28 to 30 years old, 6 feet tall and about 240 pounds. I'm begging and I'm pleading every year, after year after year for help. Meanwhile Jada's family is trying to honor her memory. Jada who was an honor student at Sterling Heights High School, a kicker for the school's football team, had just been nominated for homecoming queen. She is remembered for her gentle nature and willingness to help others. I'm grateful and I'm honored to be her mother, Jada said. If you have any information call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-SPEAK-UP. It is offering a $13,500 reward paid in cash and you will remain anonymous. Number 6 Half a century has passed since North Norfolk schoolgirl April Fab went missing. Stuart Anderson looks back at the tragic case and the hope someone could still provide the answer to what happened to April. Five decades have now passed since the disappearance of a 13-year-old girl who was cycling through the North Norfolk countryside. And despite one of the biggest investigations carried out in modern times by Norfolk police, what happened to April Fab remains a mystery. April went missing on April 8, 1969, a Tuesday and the day after the Easter long weekend. 
she cycled away from her home at three council houses Metten, near Cromer, at about 1.40 p.m., heading for an older sister's house in Rotten to give a pack of cigarettes to her brother-in-law for her birthday. She stopped to chat to a couple of friends at Harrison's farm on Cromer Road, next to a field where donkeys were grazing. A farm worker saw her just after 2 p.m. riding up Rotten Road, and shortly after her bike was seen in a field by the side of the road. Just seven minutes separated these two events, a short time frame which left wounds that will never be healed, and questions that may never be answered. Retired Detective Chief Inspector Andy Guy, who manages the cold case review team for Norfolk and Suffolk, said the case had never been closed, and they still hope to find out what happened to April. Mr. Guy said, there are two avenues, as I see it, there could be information, from people that we haven't had before, and there's the chance of finding April's remains. They would be game changers for us. April was either abducted by someone, from away who just happened to be in the area at the time, or it was close to home, somebody she knew. If it was the latter case there may be people in Norfolk, who suspect what happened, and never came forward. Mr. Guy said they were still open to anyone who could provide them with credible information, which could be a strong suspicion about someone they know. He said, there may be somebody who every anniversary acts oddly. Who doesn't want to have the TV on, or want to discuss this particular event. It may be something simple, that raises concern amongst other, people who live with them. Mr. Guy said April's disappearance led to the biggest enquiry that we have had in Norfolk Police for the past 50 years is, and countless leads had been followed up. He said a red mini, and a gray van seen in the area, had never been identified, but that seemed impossible now, as they were no longer on the DVLA database. Someone had once claimed they had seen something being buried in a well, but this was excavated in 2010, and nothing was found. Mr. Guy said there was no evidence to back up a long-held theory that child killer Robert Black was responsible, as he was working in London then, did not have a driver's license, and nothing linked him to Norfolk. April's two sisters and a number of cousins still live in the area around Rotten, but they are not willing to realize the pain of her there by talking about it in depth. Cousin Rosemary Fab, who was 27 when April went missing, said now that April's parents, Olive and Albert, had both died, the family simply wanted to move on. Rosemary said, as far as the family are concerned, the mum and dad have gone, and we just want it to be left now. Every time it's brought up you live through it all again. Rosemary said it was still hard to believe how April could have gone missing in such a short time. She was a fairly well-built girl, I thought she would have put up a fight. There's got to have been two people. While somebody was putting the bike over the hedge, she could have run off, couldn't she? The terror she must have gone through is pretty awful. Rosemary said there seemed little hope of the truth of what happened on that day ever becoming known. She said, why was nothing found, is what I ask. Seven minutes was the gap between when she was last seen to when her bike was found. She talked to her friends at the end of her road, before she went up. She added, it is an absolute mystery, isn't it? If they find anything, that would be marvelous, but I can't think that after all this time they will. I don't think anybody will ever know. If you think you may know anything about the April Fab disappearance, please contact Andy Guy on 0195343819, email unsylvetkasirviews at norfolk.pnn.police.uk, or Crimes Toppers, anonymously, on 0800555111, or at crimestoppersuk.org.